a handful of flights in Supermarine Spitfires, the single-seat fighter plane that helped win the Battle of Britain, were crucial in helping scientists understand the forces that would have to be overcome if a plane was able to fly faster than sound. The Spitfire entered service just before World War II. The brainchild of designer R.J. Mitchell. Later models of the Spitfire could fly well over 400 miles per hour in level flight, thanks to their powerful Rolls-Royce Merlin engine and the four-bladed propeller that helped generate extra thrust. Photo reconnaissance versions were even faster, flying without the dragging weight of machines guns or ammunition. The plane's superlative performance also made it a natural for test flights, especially for high-speed research. It was on these flights that some Spitfire pilots took the aircraft into previously uncharted territory, encountering the strange aerodynamic forces that occur when the sound barrier is within reach. According to famed test pilot Eric Winkle Brown's book, Wings on My Sleeve, the high-speed trials began in late 1943. During the program, squadron leader J.R. Tobin took a Mark 11 Spitfire into a 45-degree dive. The plane reached a top speed of 606 miles per hour, 975 kilometers per hour, or max 0.89. It was the fastest speed a Spitfire had ever flown, or at least the fastest that a pilot had lived to tell the tale. But a far more dramatic flight was soon to take place. In April 1944, squadron leader Anthony F. Martindale put the exact same Mark 11 Spitfire into a dive. This time, the reduction gear designed to limit its speed failed. The propeller ripped off and the diving aircraft reached more than 620 miles per hour, 1,000 kilometers per hour, as it plunged towards the ground. Martindale was saved by simple physics. With the heavy propellers wrenched off, the aircraft was now tail heavy airflow over the wing as the plane picked up speed, explains Rod Irvin, the Royal Aeronautical Society's Aerodynamics Group Chairman. When you start approaching Mach 0.85 or 0.9 propeller itself. Older aircraft had a propeller that was directly connected to the engine, more power meant the propellers would spin faster and faster. Even with a plane traveling under 300 miles per hour, the air traveling over these fast spinning blades could reach super says Kinney, you'd hear this banging and clanking as the aircraft went overhead. That's the tips of the propellers going supersonic. Mitchell and his contemporaries realized, simply connecting a propeller so it span faster and faster wouldn't necessarily help an aircraft go faster and faster. Variable pitch propellers, where the propeller would automatically match the RPM of the engine, were much more efficient and helped planes like the Spitfire fly much faster. But only so fast, says Kinney. The combination of the piston engine and the propeller are a kind of symbolic limitation of ever-increasing speed, he says and it builds the case for how monumental the turbojet revolution was. You can only get a piston engine to do so many revolutions per minute. There was this paradigm, at least for the first half of the 20th century, that planes had to go higher, faster and further. The work required to make a propeller that could work through the supersonic regime was just too much, says Kinney. And why try, when the jet engine suddenly gives you that capability? Those high-speed dives in Spitfires, and other allied fighter planes like the American P-51 Mustang and P-47 Thunderbolt, helped researchers glimpse the kind of challenges supersonic flight would bring. It led to the development of a different aircraft shape, one that could deal with the shockwaves created on the way to the sound barrier.